He is almost as still as a statue for a long moment. There is a low noise, like a soft exhaled breath, that sends a shiver through him. There is a whisper, almost too quiet and inaudible to catch. It could just be the wind, but it could also be his name. He shakes his head, not wanting to hear. The whisper grows in volume and intensity until it is very clearly calling him. Will. No. Will. What do you want from me? Get up, Will. I won't. You have to get up. I don't have to do a goddamn thing. There ain't nothing left. Nothing. There's us. No! You're just a voice, a thought. You're ashes now, like all the rest. So why shouldn't I just go like the rest of you? Eleanor Eddy enters. Because then it's all for nothing. It is for nothing. You're still here. And for what? To mourn? To grieve? To howl in the night like a goddamn animal? That's my life. That's all of it. The pain will lessen. I don't want the pain to lessen. I need it, Ellie. I need that pain. I need you. You need to live. Not without you. Not without our boy. You'll remarry. You'll have Don't. To... Don't you say it. Will. What do you want? God damn it. Can't a man just die in peace? I love you, Ellie. I miss you every day. If you love me, then make it all mean something. Don't let us die for nothing. Tell them what it was for. Why it happened. It happened because we had a dream. A tree on a hill, looking out over a lake. A place in the sun. A place of our own. Where the snows wouldn't touch us. Where our family could grow. Where we'd do more than just get by. We dreamed of America. New characters make their entrances as they sing or speak. An America that could open its arms to us. Embrace our family. Shelter us in our time of need. Give us a place to grow. America, America, God shed your grace on me. What is America? What is she but a shining beacon? A siren's call. A mother who eats her young. She wants you. She hunts you. Try and resist, but you know you're dreaming of her. This country, this madness, this undiscovered future, this pain and this sadness, is that what drew you to her? 1846, that year over 4,000 American souls took to the trails and headed west. Packing up their lives, their children, every worldly possession, and making the 1,800 mile trek on coaches, on horseback, on foot, through the heat, rain and for the truly unlucky, the snow. How great must your dream be, how desperate your hunger, to pack your life in a wagon and risk it all on the whims of an uncaring wilderness. Eighteen hundred miles. And for what?
others enter the talk of the scene. Virginia, apart from the action, narrates. July 19, 1846. The party forms officially at the crossing of the Little Sandy River, over 800 miles from the Sacramento Valley. I just want it known out in the open that I have doubts. Hey, I'm so I'm not saying that you all are going to listen to me, and I'm not saying that I'm not going. But I don't feel good about it, and I don't think it would kill us to have a discussion about it. You may need to catch me up on what the discussion is. Hello there. I'm George Donner. This soul full of doubt here is my wife, Hanson. <laughs> and the current discussion is about Hastings. the Hastings cutoff. You're really telling me it doesn't make you even in the least bit nervous. There's nothing to be nervous about. We are going down an untested trail. It's not untested. We have Hastings. Hastings. He literally wrote the book on it. Oh, I read the book. What's your concern? Who cares? Hastings went through the new route on horseback. That's one man and one horse, not 80 people with wagons. I heard from the fellow running Fort Bridger that he's leading a party a week ahead of us. That's exactly right. Would you all trust him? What's the better alternative? There is no better alternative. Listen, I hear you, Mrs. Donner. Tamsin. Tamsin. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. I hear you. But we need to be sensible about this. But what would a man have to gain from trying to trick people to using a route that doesn't work? I've read the book. I've studied it. He knows what he's talking about. Just. Just listen to this. James opens the book as Lanford Hastings with a smooth, makes a smooth appearance. He wears a large smile. I've been where you have been, my friend. I've traveled down this road before. That way is just the end, my friend.
What does it matter? We're the last party on the trail. The shortcut is exactly what we need. And if something bad happens? If something bad happens, we're dead. Now hold on. No, he's right. We're already late in the season. So whether we're on the Hastings cut off or the main trail, a serious delay is going to be dangerous. At least this way we've got more time to spare. Increasing our margin of error. Yeah, I guess that's a way to put it. We just have to work together to get there as fast as possible. And the shortest route is the Hastings route, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are we going to have to get together every time a decision needs made? I'm not big on meetings. No? <laughs> now, it's the time to elect a leader for the party. And uh, who's that supposed to be? You? Why not? George. James Reed is a strong leader. A military man. Is that a general asshole or a colonel? <laughs> So says the thief. Let me know how compassion does at feeding your family. Do you mind putting your dicks away, fellas? <laughs> Maybe some other time. <laughs> I nominate George Donner. Successful farmer, good family man. <laughs> yeah, he's alright. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second it, hoping we won't have to make any hard decisions. Yeah? Mm. I'm sure as hell hope not. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <laughs> <laughs> With the daughter party then. Don't let it go to your head, George. I'm sure you won't let that happen. <laughs> Anything else we need to take care of? I suppose no one else is going to bring up the cripple. We've got a long road ahead. Are we really going to drag dead weight with us the entire way? I don't think that's fair. What's fair? Who cares about fair? Of course a thief would say so. He's a human being. He's an invalid. But am I... I suppose a man with an invalid wife couldn't say much about bringing another along, right? Don't you talk about my wife, you fucking mongrel. Uh, hey, Luke now rides with me and my family. He's my charge and my problem. I don't need your help, and I sure as hell don't need your approval. George, do you have a muzzle for your bitch? Are you afraid of getting hit? I'm going to bed. <laughs> They picked him a couple of, up a couple weeks back. He's been left on the side of the trail by his party when he got too sick to care for himself. The bleeding hearts decided they knew better, and decided to throw him in a wagon so he could sponge off of a family until he kicks it. You think that's the right thing to do? Bringing him along? Oh, I don't know. That's fair. That's a fair answer. Better to say you don't know than just make up some bullshit to fill the empty air. I think I'm cruel. Reed called you a thief. James Reed is an idiot. A couple of men and I were out searching for supplies when I found this great big buffalo blanket in a field, so I took it. It was just lying there? Someone had spread it over some dead savage. What the hell was he going to do with it? Should I have let it sit there and get eaten by worms? Am I some kind of monster for thinking about keeping my family warm over the mountains? I don't know that I would have done it, but I guess I don't see it as being too bad. That's because you're not a fool. <laughs> I don't know about that. I packed my wife and my boy and everything we own into a cart and headed off into God knows what. <laughs> you and me both. But I've got a daughter, not a son. I'm Lewis Kesper. William Eddick. I was traveling with another party, but they wanted to go up north, so I decided to come along this way. Good to know you. It takes balls to do this, Will. Not for the weak. True. Some of these others, people like James Reed, they think it's a little Sunday John out to the courthouse. Throw the family in the wagon and poof, show up in California. But this isn't New York. I've never been to New York. Eh, it's fine enough. It's not bad. Lots of decent people there, but living in New York doesn't prepare a man for this. It separates him too much from the animal. I don't fall. We're animals, William. No different from the bear or the wolf or the deer. No, I don't know about that. It's true. We wear clothes. We put on airs. But the fact of the matter is, we're no better than any other animal on the planet. That's not a bad thing, it's just a fact. A successful animal is one that will do whatever it takes to survive, right? Right. Animals don't worry about morals. They don't worry about right and wrong. They just do whatever it takes for them to, and their young to survive. You get too far away from that and forget that a beast is a beast, and you're as good as gone. Well, well, it seems to me like we're a little better than all that. <laughs> sure. Until so we're not. We're trained well. But how long does that training last? When I was a boy in Germany, my father took me to a circus. My father was not a kind man, though. 
I don't think he was a bad person, but he had no kindness inside him. But on this one day, he took me to the circus. I loved it, of course. What child wouldn't? The star attraction, the big finale for the show, was a lion tamer. One of the most famous in the world. I'd never seen a lion before. And here were seven large lionesses in a cage, and even a bigger lion in the middle. The lion tamer entered the cage and cracked the whip, and immediately the lions were at attention. They circled around and jumped through hoops, even hopped up on their hind legs. They looked as docile as can be, not a hair out of place. And for the big finish, the lion tamer approached the large male, opened the lion's mouth, and put his head inside the beast's jaws. A trick I'm sure he'd done about a hundred times, maybe a thousand. The lion tamer gave the crowd a big grin, and suddenly, the lion snapped his jaw shut around the man's neck. The trick had failed, and the crowd knew it immediately. Panic set in, and everybody kept, began rushing for the exits. Everyone but my father. I got up to run with the rest of them. He grabbed me, sat me down hard. He took, me, he took my head in his hands and made me watch. The man was screaming and blood was pouring out of his lion's jaws. The lion shook the man around as easily as a doll. I was crying, of course, it was the most horrific thing I'd ever seen. My father leaned in close and said, Zwei Arten von Kreatur, two types of creatures, predator and prey. Same for lions, same for man. I hated my father, but he wasn't wrong. The whole world is split up into predator and prey. And in New York, they can pretend to themselves they've gotten away from that. Maybe they have, just a little. But put a man in the wilderness, and he will have to discover very quickly which he will be. Blackout. Lights up outside of the Eddie wagon. William sits against one of the wheels, smoking a cigarette and looking up at the stars. He looks gravely concerned. Am I stronger than I think I am? Am I sure this is the path to take? If I fail, will someone give a damn? My whole world is now at stake. When I lay Give him a better life. He'd have a roof over his 
his head, food on his plate, two parents that love him. And grow up to be like his dad? Some dumb farmer who can't read, can't make money. I'm damn proud of you, Will. Don't you beat up on my husband like that. <laughs> I just want more for him. I want a goddamn future, not a patch of dirt and a few rut vegetables. If our son grows up to be like his father, you'll have every reason in the world to be proud of him. <laughs> So we need to send someone ahead to find Hastings 
So he can show us the path through? Bullshit! I'll go. I'll go with you. And what the hell are we supposed to do? Hang tight. Set up camp, and we'll be back as soon as we can. James and Charles exit, followed by everyone but George and Tamsin. Tamsin. What? I know you're upset. Oh, no shit, George. I just know <laughs> you're upset. We have gone 80 miles. That's it. 80 miles, and now we get to sit here and lose time we don't have. Well, what do you want? You want to go back 80 miles and get back on the main trail? Just turn around and go back to Illinois? I want to be heard. I just want to be acknowledged once in a while. The men get together, and I feel like a novelty, a circus act. Behold, come see the educated woman. <laughs> you know I respect you. Sometimes I know that, and sometimes, sometimes I think you'd rather stay quiet. And your silence is just as good as you being on their side instead of mine. No, but I didn't want 
want to touch my stuff. <laughs> Besides, getting out of here doesn't sound too bad. Especially not if you're going to be in the mood ah, like that. Sure, I'm in a mood. So I guess I'll go be in a mood somewhere where you don't have to deal with it. That's not what I meant. I'm not mad at you. I'm just mad. Then go blow off a little steam. And bring back some food for dinner. A good meal will help lift some spirits, I think. Mm. I'll get Mrs. Reed to watch Jim, and maybe I'll go see if Mrs. Donner needs help taking care of that poor sick man they've got there. Okay, just... What? Just... Never mind. That sounds good. Come back in a little better mood? I'll try. <laughs>
takes a sap from the jar and spreads it across his forehead. I left my home. I left my home for what? To die out here in the wilderness with strangers instead of friends? God, I feel like I'm on fire, like the whole world is burning. Please, God, just do it. Let me die. The lights come back to normal as Luke groans and takes a deep breath. He stops shaking. The fever spiked a moment, but I think he's past the worst of it, and at least for now. Poor thing. How long? No. Tough to tell. He could pass tonight, tomorrow, a week from now. Only thing to do is keep him comfortable. This is a lonely way to go. Hopefully I can make it a little less so. But listen, we've got enough troubles around here waiting for them to come back with news. The rest of the camp doesn't need to know how bad it is, okay?
that's what our leader wants. Get some rest, everybody. <coughs> and sharpen your axes. Sounds like we've got some work ahead of us. Blackout. Lights up on a, on a party spread out across the stage. Chop. 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 Oh! Chop. Chop. Take over now. Chop. Chop. Okay. Okay. Chop. 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 And chop. And chop. And chop. And chop. Chop it together and chop it together and chop it together and chop it together and chop it together. Life shift to Tamsin and George. Jesus, Tamsin, this is awful. Don't push yourself too hard. What choice do we have? You can't just let the younger men take care of it. I'm too tired even to be offended at that. How many miles do we make today? You don't want to know. Camps. I'm not being funny. You don't want to know. Uh, we were at somewhere around 15 to 20 miles a day before we hit this. So, uh, 10. 8. 2. Shit. Got to get
Which means we're back on the trail. Back on the trail. Don't start. With what? With the 11 days we just lost? We didn't lose those days. Oh no, you're right. We didn't lose them. We just went 30 miles in those 11 days instead of the 200 we should have. Can we just shut the hell up for a bit? Uh, so you're on his side? I'm on the side of being goddamn tired. I'm tired <laughs> of swinging an axe. Tired of hearing you two bicker like old women. We just take a night to all peacefully shut the hell up. <laughs> Charles and Jay enter. Peace and quiet may have to wait a bit. What did you find? This canyon leads up to a ridge, and from there, well, it's a hell of a sight. A desert. We're already in the desert. Not like the one up ahead. It's white, like salt. Salt? It's beautiful, honestly. It's white a thing that you've ever seen. But that ain't the only thing we found. Charles holds up a note. Oh, my wife is not going to like this. <laughs> <laughs> one of you fellas want to do the honors? James takes the note as Anne Hastings enters from the other side, narrating the text. There is a land of salt and heat, the smart ones will take care. Get set. Thank you. 
front of us is alien. Bizarre. It's beautiful. It's like the sand in the early golden light. But it's a lie. A lie. A beautiful lie. It's salt. Can't it be? Miles and miles of salt. Salt? You can taste it in the air. It stings the skin even in the lightest breeze. Hurts like hell when it hits your eyes. We take the wagon slow. Careful. We don't know anything about driving on salt. But the day gets hot. God, it's hot. It shines off the salt. Blinds you. And the salt is hiding a secret. A beautiful lie. The salt's thin. The boggy, marshy bullshit underneath is a lot deeper. <laughs> <laughs> we push the wagons as hard as we can. Our oxen are already exhausted. Bone tired. My bad feeling is getting worse. Worse. Much worse. On the first day, the going is slow. On well, the second, it's even worse. Two days. Two days. Isn't that what Hastings said? Hastings. A two-day push through the desert. Two turns to three. Does it end? Mm. This can't go on forever, right? Right. But there's no end in sight. Take my little sisters in my arms and carry them as far as I can. The mud's getting deeper. Six inches. Eight. And on the third day, the mud is halfway up the wheels. Uh, hell. Hell of a shortcut. If you've got a smaller wagon, a lighter one, you might be able to push through. But the reeds. reeds. God damn it, can't someone help me push this thing? I see, he needs help. But what the hell am I supposed to do? Leave him. Little help. Any. They pass right by. Yes, our wagon is large. Custom built. Made for a large family to be comfortable. Built in stove, a couple of actual beds. And I can feel that resentment. I felt it the whole time. Fuck me for having a little money, right? Fuck me for trying to provide for my family the same as you do for yours. We fall behind. Way behind. And the sun starts to set on day three. Three days. I know we're not catching up. Not like this. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. All I wanted to do was to get us there fast and comfortable, and this is what happens. What did I do wrong? Nothing. Everything. <laughs> I'm sorry, boys. You have to leave the wagon. Push. Push! Push! Take what you can carry, let the oxen try to find water on their own. I have a little doll. Push through the night if you have to. I should have left it. Left it at the wagon, taking a few coins for a little more flour. Day four, and no end in sight. But is keeping the doll so bad? Do I have to give everything away? Haven't I lost enough already? Day four. Four. We weren't ready. Not even close. How do you prepare for a desert of salt? What the hell did I sign up for? <laughs> I see it. What? What is it? It's there, that shimmer. It's them. Hastings? Has to be. Don't you see it? I see... Nothing. A lake! A shimmer. Nothing. I run as fast as I can, but the further I go, the further away it gets. I told you. That shimmer. The heat. I cry, but I'm too damn thirsty. Keep going. Day five comes, and for the first time in my life, I wonder if I'm about to die. We're not dead yet. Don't stop. Take a step, then another. I won't die in this godforsaken desert. The cattle escape. We should go after them, but it's useless. Pointless. The animals can smell water. Maybe they know which way to go. William, go. Go on ahead. What? No. If we both die of thirst, Jim dies too. Go find water and come back to us. Oh, God. Please. I go. What choice is there? I push ahead as fast as I can, my skin turning to blisters. And push ahead, leaving my entire life behind. Push. 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 Step. Just one, then another. Don't stop. Day six dawns and the mountains in the distance start to grow. Is this it? It better be. <coughs> I don't know. Don't say it. How much longer I can go. Can't move on, old man. My mouth tastes like blood and salt. I feel like I'm going blind. But push. Push. Push, push not give you. And then, then. And then it's done. It's over. The salt gives way to grass and a stream. I take a long drink, and it all comes right back up. I stick my head in the stream and think of drowning myself. <laughs> <laughs> we made it. Barely. Six days in the desert. We met camp in the foothills next to a stream. We hold our children tight. We try to rest. But sleep doesn't come. If I have the thought, I'm sure others have it too. We're not going to make it to California. Blackout. Lights up on the parking assembling around another campfire. It is early evening. I thought we weren't going to have a lot of meetings. We caught a lot of things when we started. Do you like the boat? <laughs> Only if the question is you taking a bath. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Approved. Anyone got soap? All right, folks. Let's gather. I think we have a lot to talk about. Any of it good? No. It's been a few days.
days, and we've managed to find a few of the cattle that got loose in the desert, but I think we can all agree that things aren't going too hot. No shit. I'd like to hear from the families on what they've got left, so uh, maybe we can pool resources a bit. We lost an ox and a few cattle, but we're getting by. Might have a little food to help others if they need. Our oxen made it through, but I think we're going to lose one before too long. He's got a bum foot. Supplies are starting to get slim. We're doing all right, but there are a lot of us, and I think food is going to get scarce before too long. Our wagon took a hell of a beating, and we're having to repair it more often. I don't have to share how we're doing. It's my business now. <laughs> my business. Well, I'm going to be honest, folks. My family isn't doing well. I've lost over half of my livestock, most of my oxen, and two wagons. Not to mention the bulk of our possessions. Now, I'm, I'm not a begging man. You sure? I'm not a begging man. But I don't see how my family is going to make it to California like this. James, I think the problem is bigger than that. You can correct me if I'm wrong, folks, but I have a feeling most of us don't have enough supplies to make it to California in our current state. Am I wrong? Shit. So, we all got to put our heads together and figure out how to get ourselves out of this mess. How the hell did we get into this kind of mess in the first place? I think we should send a couple of men ahead on the horseback. Get out to Sutter's Ford. John Sutter's a good man from what I hear. He'll help us. So, someone will have to make it over the mountains and then come back with supplies? That's a hell of a trip. I'll do it. Y'all have got families. I just have myself to worry about. <clears throat> Load me up with a horse and food and I'll do it. Now, hold on a minute. I'm fine with that, but I had a question. How the hell did we get into this mess? <laughs> I'm a bit late to the party, so maybe someone can explain that to me? You're a wagon driver, right? I'm a guy asking questions is what I am. <laughs> I could be the king of fucking England. Don't know what my job has to do with my questions. We don't need this. Can we do this another time, though? I just want to know. What good is that going to do? Maybe if I know who got us into this mess, I'll know who I should listen to or not when they speak. <laughs> Our friend James Reed here persuaded us to continue on down this route. Don't you put this all on me. We all decided. Mm, not all of us. So it's you I need to be pissed off at? I'll admit my mistakes, but I'm not taking the blame for all this. You won't take the blame, but you'll take the hand I'll do whatever I have to to protect my family. Some of us care for ours. I just want an explanation. What the hell makes you think you're owed anything? Can we all You've got some fucking attitude, friend. I've got enough of this shit from the wife beater over there. I don't need to hear it from you. Choose those words carefully. Calm down. You think you're better than me? Because you've got money? But hell, you ain't even got money anymore. Now you ain't got shit! James pushes John. There's an outcry from several people as John punches James. The two fight, grappling and pushing one another. Virginia rushes in to get between them, and John backhands her to the ground. Get off me! James, enraged by seeing his daughter struck, rushes at John with his knife drawn. The two go to the ground, and John screams. Oh, fuck! Oh. Oh, God, he stabbed me. George and William rush to James and pull him away from John. <coughs> Tamsin and Sarah rush to John and help him up and off the stage. Eleanor helps Virginia, and they both follow to help with John. Foster and Charles leap after them. Left on stage are William, George, Lewis, and James. James? I didn't... I wasn't trying to... What exactly were you trying to do? He hit my daughter. And you killed him for it? I was just trying to scare him. Yeah. I think he scared him pretty good. <laughs> George, this is real bad, James. I'm sorry. Oh shit, I'm so sorry. I know you are, but I don't know if that's gonna help. Maybe it's not as bad as it looks. Eleanor enters, wiping bloody hands on a rag. She looks at William for a long moment and shakes her head. Oh shit. What? I don't think you made it, James. No. You killed him. No, I didn't mean to. I didn't. He was a popular fella, James. People are going to be awful sore that you went and murdered a man that everyone liked. George. I need to go see my wife. George stops him gently but firmly. I'm sorry, James. I can't let you leave. What? We need to gather everyone up. We need to figure out what to do about no. it. No, please. It's not up to me. Can't be. Others begin entering, a few of them with blood on their hands. Sarah and Jay enter last. Sarah is weeping and Jay is holding her close. Virginia 
Virginia stands apart from her father at Tamsin's side. There wasn't anything we could do. He was gone by the time we were really looking at him. I'm sorry. Folks, let's not beat around the bush, folks. One of our party members has just been murdered, and there's no one here but us to decide what justice looks like. Call it a decision or a trial or whatever you want. There's blood on the ground, and that blood cries out for justice. There's a man on the ground, there is blood in the air, I can taste it. There's a chance to get back what's been done to this man that's not wasted. And the vengeance won't take back alive. We'll have justice for that what was done at the end of a knife. Frontier justice. Blood for blood and I die. Frontier justice. Why did poor John Snyder have to die? And though he is gone, he will carry this pain. And what shall we do with the murder? James Reed must end. I'm a believe I'm a good man, a family man, a man of virtue. I admit I've done wrong, I was dead wrong, but I will not hurt you. What I did in the moment I cannot take back, but look at my soul and then tell me, do you think it's blood?
You killed a man, James. There's no coming back from that. I'll go get help. I'll make it to California and I'll tell them what's going on. I will bring back help, I promise. Banishment, then. Shit. Any objections? Then that's it. Just you, James. We will look after your family. If anything happens to them, it's on your hands. All of them. James exits. Virginia begins to go after him and stops. She kneels on the ground, staring at the sky. What do we do now? We bury John, we make camp, and we pray. In the morning, we'll... Oh, God, look! Others watch as Virginia tracks a single snowflake in the air. She reaches, it out, reaches her hands out, and it lands in her palm. It can't be. What is it? Snow. Blackout. End of Act One. There will be a ten-minute intermission. <laughs> Back this way, 
I would have been in some serious shit if not for Salvador. Is there more help coming? I think so, but I don't know that it's coming soon. There's a war on, apparently. What? Down south. They're fighting the Mexicans, I guess. What the hell does that have to do with us? It means that most of the able-bodied men are down there fighting. The ones who'd be making a rescue party. Exactly. They know we're here, and I know if they can get help to us, they will. But for now, well, we got some flour and dried beef and such. How long can we make it last? Well, don't get greedy with it. That's all I can say. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for coming back. It's good to see y'all again. Though it was a little warmer in Sutter's Fort, I gotta confess. Let's get those bags indoors. You said there were mules. Yes, sir. A little fresh meat, then. Bad day to be a mule. Bad day to be Indians. William takes Eleanor aside, and the rest go for the bags. You think Mrs. Reed watched Jim for a bit? What? I guess so. Why? Just for the afternoon, will you ask her? What's going on? Nothing bad. Don't worry. Oh. Okay, if you're sure. I'm sure. Meet me outside. Bring your coat. Eleanor exit. Tamsin grabs William before he can leave. William. Yes? Do you think we're going to make it? We have to. Do you think we will? We can't lose hope. Never. I'm scared. And my children are scared. And my husband is so sick, he stopped being scared a week ago. That's almost worse. You're strong. Stronger than most, I think. We're going to get our kids over those mountains. You and me both. Thank you. Life shift. William and Eleanor are on a high hill overlooking the lake. They are wrapped up in thick coats, and William is leading her by the hand. He leads her on top of a blanket in the snow with a few bits of food spread out. Can I look yet? Not yet. William, Eddie, what is all this? Okay. You can open your eyes. Will. It's a picnic. Or as near as we'll get out here. It's beautiful. Do you see how pretty the lake looks? I see it, Will. You didn't have to do all this. I know, but I wanted to. Come here, sit with me. They sit together. He holds her, he hands her a little food, and she looks at it for a moment. I'm going to feel guilty eating this. Don't. It's not much. Now we've got more food from Charles. What's this all about? I love you. I love you too, Will. And even in this awful situation, Lenny, I still want to show you. You're going to make me cry. No, don't. The tears will freeze to your face. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't much, but sitting here next to you, I can imagine how it's going to be when we get to California. You think it'll look like this? It'll be green and beautiful. And I'll find us a place with a little lake in a spot like this looking out over it. We'll picnic there? All three of us. And we can watch the sun set over our lake on our land. Just three? <laughs> Hell no! Four, five! <laughs> us and a whole gang of kids. I'd like that very much. We're going to have it. All of it. Over the mountains there lies a valley with a beautiful lake fed by a stream. There's a hill and a tree and a cozy spot. And that there's our valley, that there's our dream. And that lake, it looks just like this one. of our 
more mullet, but it's even possible to call it that, emerges. In two cabins and a couple of tents, the nearly 80 people of the Donner Party huddle for warmth while simultaneously trying to get as far away from each other as possible. <laughs> the balance between cabin fever and freezing temperatures makes for miserable living. And a couple of weeks before Christmas, it starts becoming more and more clear that Stanton's supplies are running dry and drastic measures are the only ones left. Lights shift to a campfire in the cabin, likely the final one as a whole party. Around the fire are all the named characters besides George. Everyone doing okay in the other cabin? No, but no worse than anyone else here. Virginia, how's your family getting along? Everyone's still there. We asked another family for food, and they had us pay triple for a cattle leg. Hard times. That's a way to put it. I don't know if you heard, but we had a couple of deaths in our cabin. They were sick? Sick, starving. People were getting a common cold and dying because they don't have enough food to get over it. There's a couple more in our cabin who might not make the week. <coughs> this isn't sustainable. What do we do about it? I've tried hunting. There's nothing around. You shot that bear a couple weeks ago. And a near took my head off before it went down. And despite that, I tracked down another if I could. The game is just gone. <coughs> All of them already down past the foothills. And we couldn't do that too? I looked at my wagon a few days ago. Could barely find it. The snow was over ten feet high now. We can't stay here. We could spend two weeks trying to unbury those wagons just to starve to death and die of exposure. Well, it's true. I want to get out of here, but those wagons aren't moving until the snow's gone. And what do we do? When I was a boy, we made snowshoes. Wood frames and leather strings across made it to where we could walk on top of the snow. So we walk out of here? To California? I'm not walking anywhere. Not on this bum ankle. Won't do to have the whole party walking anyway. Most of the people are too weak to make it out. They die halfway across. So who goes? The strongest. We need to make it on as little food as possible. What happens to everyone else? My brothers and sisters can't do the walk. They'll have to stay here. But who's going to look after them? The families who stay behind will have to look out for themselves. And with some more people gone from the camp, there will be more food to go around. A little more, anyway. What happens when we get there? We tell them what's really happening. There may be a war on, but there has to be some people who can help. Even just a few. They won't be able to deny it when we're right in front of them. Do you think that'll work? Well, what other choice is there? I'm not going to lie, folks. This isn't going to be easy. I did the hike a month ago, and the snow has only gotten worse from there. <clears throat> and it's only gotten colder. We'll have Salvador to help guide us, but there's no trail to follow. It should be six or eight days to get there, but that's only if we don't find trouble. So, how many pairs of snowshoes do we make? Who's going? Jay and I will go, and I think my father and little brother can make it. I think I can make it. I guess I'm going. I'll have to stay with Jim, but you need to go. I know, I know. Shit. Tamsin? I can't. You're in better shape than most of us. I can't leave George, I'm sorry. His brother Jacob has almost gone himself, and I won't let George die alone. I just can't. Mm -hmm. Who else? I'm going. I think my wife can, too. I'd rather die on my feet. I'll head over to the other cabin and ask there, too. We'll need a few days to make the shoes, so make whatever preparations you need to. People begin to stand as the meeting begins to break up. Wait! Can... Will you all do something for me? Can we pray together? Everyone has their own personal reaction to this. Some are immediately on board, some hesitate, but everyone, even Lewis, sits back down in the circle and joins hand, hands as the music begins. As people sing, they leave the circle, expressing their inner Dear God, please keep us safe. We are your children, and we put our lives in your hands. Am I stronger than I think I am? Am I sure this is the path to take? If I fail, will someone give?
I'll do my best. I know you will. I don't want to go. I know. I don't have a choice, do I? No. Ellie, if something Don't, is, don't say it. Don't think I'm it. trying to be realistic. This isn't the time for that, Will. Fuck realism. I need hope. All the hope. Blind, dumb, stupid hope. Because if you go and I let myself think for even a second that you didn't make it, I don't know that I'm going to be able to keep going. So you're going to go, and you're going to make it there, and then you're going to lead a big rescue party back here and save us. Right? Right. I love you, Ellie. I love you so much. I love you, Will. You promised me a valley. I'm holding you to that. Light ship to Charles. December 17th. Five women and ten men wake before dawn has even touched the summit before them. We have small packs filled with blankets, basic supplies, and six days of rations. Starvation rations. Barely enough if you were sitting still, but it's all that can be spared. The oldest in the snowshoe party is 57. The youngest is only 12. Hmm. Mothers and fathers kiss their children one last time and take the first steps into the icy morning. Tears still wet on their cheeks. Hmm. The snowshoes are unwieldy, but they work. Most of the time. The snow is 10 feet deep at the cabins and only gets deeper as we begin to climb. The first two days are almost nice. Brutal. But at least we're doing something. For the past month, we've all just sat on our hands waiting for something to happen. But now, it feels like progress. On this third day, we reach the summit. Reach it and pass it. I try not to get my hopes up, but God damn it, we might just do this. As we make camp on the third day, we have a small toast. I have a little whiskey left. Enough for everyone to have a drop. Disgusting. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> we toast our loved ones back at the camp. We toast the summit ourselves, too. But even with everyone toasting and laughing for a moment, the fear doesn't leave. The first three days, the sky is clear. Colder that way, but we can see the sun and the stars for navigation. On the morning of the fourth day, the clouds are so thick that the sun completely disappears. There are no straight paths, no roads to travel on. We struggle down one cliff, try to reorient ourselves west, and struggle up the next. I know our progress is slower, and I know I can't go on much longer like this. Push, push. Push, goddamn you! On day five, the last of our food is gone. Already? Keep going. We'll starve! Not if we make it there first. My eyesight starts to fail. Even on the cloudy days, it's bright white all around. White, even with my eyes closed. Are we lost? I don't know. Ask the Indian? We don't know! We're heading west, best as I can tell, but what the hell am I supposed to look for? The landmarks are all buried a dozen feet below us. We're looking at the tops of trees, trying to find a trail. I, I'm tired. We're all tired. No, I'm, I'm tired. I'm done. Mm -hmm. On the morning of day six, we break camp. Charles is now sitting. Come on, Charles. Time to go. I'm, I'll catch up. Foster is already heading out. Sarah and Jay look at one another, then look to William. Gives them a nod and they leave. It's awful cold here, Charles. You need to get up to get warm. I don't think I can, Will. I'm real tired, and I don't know that I can see where I'm going anymore. I think I'm snow blind. Can you see me here? A little. Not much. Can I get you anything? Will you fill my pipe before you go? I ran out of tobacco a couple days ago. I'm happy to. My pipe's in my pack over. It's here. Thank you. William fills the pipe and places it in Charles's hands. I've got a couple of matches in my pack, I think. William pulls out a match and lights the pipe. You're a good man, Will. I don't feel good leaving you. I know. But you've got all those others to think about. Virginia pulls the doll out of her pack. Mr. Stanton, I've had this doll a long time. It's not much, but it's helped me feel better when I felt alone. She places it in Charles's hands. He grabs onto it tight and slowly brings it to his cheek. It's soft. Yes, it is. This, it's really wonderful. Virginia, on the verge of losing her composure, kneels and gently hugs Charles. He hugs her back weakly, and she runs off. Anything else I can do? No. I'm going to sit a while. I've been so tired this whole time, Will. From the first day all the way back in Missouri. I've got an ache deep in my bones. I think it'll be good to get some rest. You get those people across, Will. You're the leader, whether you want to be or not. William clasps one of Charles's hands for a moment, then exits, leaving Charles alone. He smokes his pipe slowly and sings, looking out blindly over the snow. Oh, after many roving years, how sweet it is to come to the dwelling place of early.
What the hell do you mean? I mean we draw lots. The short lot loses. No. Someone has to die, but that's the only fair way. You can't be serious! Be serious? You were the one who said we had to. Now you want to say that it's wrong? We'll do what it must, though. We'll be sad, too.
Four people die in the next two days. You push the bodies out of the makeshift tent and into the snow. Out there, they can be preserved. My father dies. God, Sarah, I... He was a good man. A lot of men are important or smart or handsome. But there aren't a lot that are really and truly good. He was good to his daughters and good to my husband. He was wonderful. I hold him as he dies. He looks like he's sleeping, but there's this horrible rattling in his chest as he breathes. The wind howls outside. The snow pushes through the bottom of the tent. I ask him if there's anything he wants to say. I keep hoping for some kind of last words, but it's too late. I think of my own father. Is he still on his farm back in Illinois? Is he happy? I don't know if he can hear me, but I talk anyway. I talk and talk until the last breath. And then it stops. I feel like my heart stops with it. I sit with the body a while, and then I just sit. We sit. We watch each other. Another drops a few hours later. His hand lands in the fire. I want to move him, but I just sit there, watching. His glove catches fire, smolders in the snow. I want to scream. I want to do something. I want to do something. I'm about to move him when I feel him breathe, and he moans. Goddamn scared me half to death. He holds on for a bit, but dies a little while later. Two days in the tent. Two days, staring at each other. Waiting, waiting, waiting. When the storm finally stops, I hardly notice the wind is so constant I still hear it. But the storm does pass, and there's still ten of us here, and we have to go on. Come on, Jesus. There's grim work ahead, and we don't have time to lose. We take off the clothes. Make sure the belongings go to someone who can care for them. Then, you make the initial cuts. I guess when you look at it, a person isn't much different than a deer. It's disgusting. You remove the skin. You take off the large sections, the legs and the arms, back, chest. You take out the organs. I want to throw up, but there's nothing in my stomach. The organs have to be cooked right away. They won't keep. The meat, you lay out in thin strips. Try to preserve it as best we can. You make a stew. God, I want to say no. I want to refuse it. I want to say I'd rather starve to death than eat. But I eat anyway. It's horrible. But it's the most any of us have had to eat in a week. It takes half the day to do it. When it's done, we bury what's left. The sad fact is we've all been starving for months. Four people doesn't equal a lot of meat. One person wouldn't have made a difference. The relatives try their best not to watch. We keep the meat separate so no one eats their own. I see my father's head lying in the snow, his skull open. I wonder in that moment what it would feel like to kill myself. We eat. We eat. We eat. I lie. I lie right to their faces. I don't mean to. I don't want to, but it's a lie nonetheless. <clears throat> in our second day in the tent, I reach into my pack to find some tobacco and reach all the way down to the bottom. There's a little cloth package down there. I pull it up, trying to keep it to myself, and there's a note. Eleanor appears. Well, I can't spare much, but I've been hiding this away. Probably just a pound or so, and I hope you make it through to safety long before you need it, but take it. Use it. I know if I'd asked, you would have said no, so I'm not asking. Take this and my love, and make, this, make it safely back to me. Yours always, Ellie. Eleanor disappears. A pound of preserved bear meat. It's not much, but it's enough for now. I could share it, and we'd all eat a little better for a moment. Or we could keep it hidden, use it alone, and make it just a little bit closer to California. It keeps me from having to eat human flesh, at least for a day or two. Blackout. Light shifts to Eleanor at the lake camp, reading an old letter. Tamsin enters. Hello? Tamsin, what are you doing here? I'm looking for help for some people who can dig. Some of the stronger folks went to try to catch fish for the ice. I can't do this alone. <clears throat> but do what? I'm trying to find a cattle. When we got here, we had four head of cattle with us near our tent. They died and they got buried in the snow. Two months of snow. It feels hopeless, but God, if I can just find those cattle. Do you know exactly where they are? No. Oh, shit. No, I don't. I don't even know where to start looking, but I don't know what else to do. Our wagon driver died last night. Milt. He'd been with us a long time on the farm back home, too. I'm really sorry to hear it. We buried him under a little snow close by. Close? We've got nothing to eat. 
and I know that no one has anything to eat, so I can't come up here and ask for food, but if I can find the cattle, then, then, then we don't have to eat milk. Oh, God. <laughs> I've got five children looking at me. Some ask, some don't. My four-year-old Tom spends his days lying on the floor, holding his daddy's hand and staring at the wall. What the hell am I supposed to do? I'm going to go check the other cabin, see if anyone can come dig with me. Tam's an exit, blackout, lights up on Virginia. You and me last five days, and still we have less, and still we can't find our way over the mountains. The morning of January 7th comes, and we see no closer than when we start. Lights up on the social party. Sarah is struggling to keep Jay on his feet. Wait! I, we need to stop for a second. Sarah helps Jay to the ground as he collapses. Jay, please stay with me. I'm here. That's good. She squeezes his hand. Can you feel that? Sarah, I'm cold. Real cold. Please don't go. I don't want to die alone. I need a fire. Something. I really need help here. I can make a fire. Will. Shh. Will, I think he's going to. Virginia, I need you to shut up. Can you hear that? Hear what? It's way off. I don't hear anything. I think it's a deer. I thought I heard it a while ago, but it sounds louder now. Gotta go. You're leaving us? I have to go track it down. Even a small deer could be enough to get us through. Please don't go. I'm not your father, and I'm not your leader. But if I can get us all through, I'm gonna do it. I'll be back as quick as I can. Just think of it like hunting back on the farm. Have to keep an even pace, have to give a little space, have a calm and steady arm. Find a good position, find the time to take my shot And try not to think that we're so on the brink That this may be the only chance that we've got Get out of bed by myself. 
A week after that, I try leading a group of men back in the mountains, but my body gives out in half a day. I sit at Sutter's Point. I stare at those goddamn mountains, and I have nightmare after nightmare about what's happened to my family. God, please, please don't tell me I made it through for nothing. Blackout. Lights up on Eleanor. She looks ragged and gaunt. She sits on the floor, hugging her knees. <laughs>
first relief party arrives on February 18th and takes the strongest with them. But even amongst the strongest, many aren't strong enough to make it across to freedom and die along the way. The second relief arrives on March 1st, and already six more have died. With every party that comes, I send off more of my children. Miracles may be rare here, but all of my babies make it across to California. Every relief party has survivors, and every one has casualties. The horror is slow and constantly churning. April 17, 1847, the final relief party arrives at the lake camp. By this time, there is just one survivor left living there. The party is led by an all-too-familiar face. Lights up on, cap on a cabin in ruins. There are bodies everywhere in heaps and pieces. Sitting against one wall is Lewis. There's a pot on the fire. William enters. Are you a spirit? No. And the world is still truly full of surprises, isn't it? And after all this, it's a high bar. You're here to rescue me? I'm here for my family. <sighs> Jesus Christ, Will. It's been months. You didn't expect them to still be alive, did you? I... Three rescue parties have come and gone. I'm sure you've seen them. I'm... I'm sure you talked with them. They, they didn't tell you? I had to come see. To see what, for God's sake? I want to know what happened. Why? What could knowing possibly do for you? I want to know. They died, Will. They all died. Your wife, my son, your son, my daughter, they, they're gone. Where's my family now? Louis gestures towards the pile of bodies. In there, maybe? William Probably. Why, William finally takes him to see the around him. Jesus Christ. What the fuck has been going on here? Survival. All these people. If you're gonna come here and judge me? This is horrible. Of course it is. What did you really expect? Are you really so free of sin? Were you eating steak dinners on your way out with a snowshoe party? Or something worse. We did what we had to. And so did I. They died. I survived. They failed. And I didn't. It's been a long winter, Will. I don't know what things have looked like where you've been staying, but we ran out of food months ago. We ate blankets. Shoes. The goddamn hide roof of the cabin. Have you eaten hide, Will? You boil the leather until you can chew it, and it tastes like rot and mold in your jaw, eggs, trying to get even a single bite down. You drink the water it's boiled in just to get a little nourishment, a little more nourishment out of it, and that tastes even worse. A day or two of that, and your jaw starts to <laughs> seize up, and chewings are hard. You're putting out more energy than you're taking in just from the work of it. You can feel yourself starving to death, even as you're eating. And the more we ate, the colder it got and the snow started to get in. Can you even imagine how good it is to have actual meat after weeks of that? Fresh meat? You're an animal! Yes, we all are! Predator and prey! You made it, I made it, that puts us at the top of the food chain! And you give up being human to do it? What does it matter? What the fuck does it being human matter? when the alternative is starving to death. Nature doesn't care about us, Will. Nature doesn't care about whether we live or die. It doesn't judge us, and it doesn't treat us any different if, we, if we're good people or animals. You can be a good person, the best person. You still die in the snow. My daughter, Ada, was three years old. She loved drawing pictures of her mother and I. She loved the color blue. She loved to sing the old German folk song my mother taught her. She was the sweetest, purest person I've ever known. And I watched her die here in the cabin. So if, you're, if you'd like to march in here and judge what I've done, you can go fuck yourself. You, that Donner bitch, and everyone else, go fuck yourself. Tamsin Donner? I thought she was dead. Figured she was. Since no one had come out from their camp in weeks, the world keeps
keeps surprising me over and over again, doesn't it? Where is she? The liver's in the pot. Jesus. Did you? Did I what? Kill her? What do you care? I want to know. Did you want to know about your family? Did you want to hear how your wife held on to your son for hours and hours after he died? You want to hear how she sobbed? You want to hear what it was like to cut the meat off of them? If that's what's going to make you feel better. You want closure, Will? You want fucking closure? Well, you need closure, and I need to, I needed to survive. William strikes Lewis, and Lewis falls to the floor. William unsheathes his hunting knife and puts it to Lewis's throat. <laughs> Is that what it's going to do? Is that what's going to do it? Is that the thing you're going to make you feel better, Will? Then do it. I'm not strong enough to fight you on it. It'd be a hell of an irony for me to make it through the winter here and die at the end of your night. But I'm beyond trying to make sense of any of this shit. William pushes Lewis away and sheaths his knife. Lewis puts a finger to his throat and looks for blood on it. He looks terrified and relieved. If I have to live through this, then you do too. And live with it. Killing you would be letting you off easy. Lights begin to slowly fade until only William is illuminated. There's no coming back from this. Maybe we can go on living, but there's a part of all of us that died in these mountains. When we set out, I feel like I knew why we did it, but now, I just don't know. In the end, we're all just bones and meat, and all I've got left are nightmares. We're just history. I don't want to be history. All my wife and my boy. What the hell's it all for? What's left? As people speak, they are illuminated. An idea. What does that matter? It always matters. It may be the only thing that really does matter. There's a dream of an idea. A dream of America. Deal. Not as it is, but as it could be. Place endless possibilities. Place of hope. Where you can make a better life for your children. Where you can grow up to do anything. Where you can find a value of your own, no matter who you are. Or where you started. Maybe the ones who understand it most are the ones who have had to fight for it. Crossing deserts. Oceans. Facing seemingly insurmountable challenges, endless perils, and continuing on in the face of it. Risking their lives. The lives of their children. Putting everything in their world into a single bundle. And putting their faith in a dream in a place. In America. And as long as they're still an American dream, then maybe what happened here isn't all for nothing. We are stronger.